Hello, thank you for joining us for Building Strong Communities. I'm Erica Manny, the Chief Executive Officer for the American Red Cross Central Appalachia Region. I hope this show will provide you with the vital information to help keep you and your loved ones safe and keep a strong and resilient community. The mission of the American Red Cross is to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. The Red Cross aspires to turn compassion into action so that all people affected by disaster across the country and around the world receive care, shelter, and hope. Our communities are ready and prepared for disasters. Everyone has access to safe, life-saving blood and blood products. All members of our armed services and their families find support and comfort whenever needed. And in an emergency, there are always trained individuals nearby ready to use their Red Cross skills to save lives. Through this show, we will provide you with critical life-saving information for you, your family, and your community. In today's episode, in honor of January being World Blood Donor Month, we will explore how the American Red Cross works with generous blood donors, blood drive sponsors, and our communities to help fight cancer. Every two seconds, someone in the U.S. needs blood. It is essential for surgeries, cancer treatment, chronic illnesses, and traumatic injuries. The Red Cross provides about 40% of our nation's blood and blood components, all from generous volunteer donors. Yet, only 3% of Americans donate blood in a given year. Each day, the Red Cross needs to collect about 12,500 blood donations to meet the needs of patients across the country. Blood and platelets cannot be manufactured. They can only come from volunteer donors, where one donation can help save more than one life. Blood can be safely donated every 56 days, up to six times a year, and power red donations can be given every 112 days. This year, 1.9 million people will be diagnosed with cancer. Every minute, three people are diagnosed with cancer, and one in three people in the U.S. are diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. 15,000 children are diagnosed with cancer each year in the U.S. And cancer patients use nearly one quarter of the blood supply, more than patients fighting any other disease. About six blood products are needed every minute to help someone going through cancer treatment. Cancer and cancer treatments can put patients at risk for low red blood cells and low platelet counts. Blood and platelet transfusions are then a critical part of cancer patients' care. Some types of chemotherapy can damage bone marrow, which lowers the production of platelets, and a blood transfusion might give patients relief for some symptoms and improve their quality of life. Cancers such as leukemia and lymphoma attack the bone marrow as well. A low platelet count can affect a patient's ability to produce healthy blood cells and even stop bleeding during surgical procedures. Critical treatments can be put on hold some reasons people with cancer might need blood transfusions are because of internal bleeding. Blood cancers like leukemia can crowd out healthy blood cells in the bone marrow. People who have had cancer for a while may actually develop anemia. And cancers that affect organs like the liver and spleen are common. Some people with cancer might need blood transfusions because of side effects such as chemotherapy and radiation as well as bleeding after certain surgeries. People who give blood usually donate whole blood. Whole blood can be separated into parts and each part does a separate job. This way, one unit of whole blood can be used to help more than one person and the person getting a transfusion only gets the part that they need. Speaking of helping, we have a special guest with us today his name is Anthony Treadway, and he's the manager of construction at West Virginia American Water. And he has a personal story to share with us today as to why he and his family are interested in making sure that people know the importance of giving blood. Anthony, thank you for joining us today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Eric. I'm happy to be here. Well, can you share with us um, your story on what makes you so passionate about blood donation? Absolutely. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, my family has a lot of experience with what you just talked about. As I'm listening to you go through those statistics, um, uh, it's, it's an amazing number. It's, uh, it's sad to hear, but there are too many people out there who have experienced exactly what you talk about. Um, 
just to give you a little idea of where we began and the reason I am so passionate about getting more people interested in donating blood. My sister was diagnosed in 2000, uh, what, she passed away in 2009, and she was diagnosed four years prior to that with breast cancer. And so she went through a four year long battle that associated many challenges with it. But one of, the, one of the things she really needed and came to depend on that we never really thought about or knew anything about was the need for blood donations. She had to have blood transfusions on a pretty regular basis throughout those four years of her life. Um, and one of the things that I tell a lot of people, the reason I think it's a good selling point to try to convince folks of the importance of it, she had three young children at the time. And, um, you know, that was, that was time that she gained with her kids. Without those blood donations that she was able to receive when she was in the hospital many, many different times over the course of four years, she would not have had that time with her, with her children. And we've oftentimes talked about she said to us, this has extended my life, no doubt about it, to spend time with my kids. The other side of that is it extended the time that her kids got to have with her. And at the time, no one knew how long she, we would have my sister. Uh, obviously, we hoped that this would be something we would work through and she would be one of the many survivors that we celebrate today. But that wasn't the case. Uh, the incredible thing about Terry is that before she passed away, she recognized how she had benefited from the generosity of so many other people. And she said, hey, I want to give back. This is how our story began. She said, uh, it was the summer of 2009, she said, I want to set up a blood drive because I've received so much, I think over 30 units at the time. And she said, I want to give back. What can we do? And so, of course, she was weak at the time, but we helped organize a blood drive. First time we'd ever done it. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, and it was a mobile blood drive that we set up. I think we brought in maybe 25 to 30 units of blood. And so we were just very encouraged by that first experience, as was Terry. And we said, hey, let's do this again. We're gonna continue this, let's try to do it one more time. So we set it up for October, which was Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we said that'll maybe help us bring in a few more people because our message was about cancer patients, as you just talked about here. And um, we recruited really hard. We had a lot of people signed up for the blood drive and we thought we were doing really well. Unfortunately, my sister passed away three days before the blood drive. Um, and so of course we, we continued and we had the blood drive, but the outpouring from the community, the people that showed up far more than we had signed up on the list. And so I think we did over a hundred units of blood this, that day. And from that moment, forward, we said, this is something we're going to continue. We're, we, this is her legacy now. We're going to make sure that it is. Um, in addition to that, something that Terry had said to us as she kind of realized her fate in, in that last year of her life, she said, you know, someday something good will come of this. And so we took that as, as our mantra. You know, that, that was something that we could hold on to and say, you know what, in order for that to be true, it's up to us. And so we carried on that every October since 2009, we've hosted what we call the Terry Massey Memorial Blood Drive with you guys. And to this day, I think we're pushing 1,500 units of blood that we've been able to bring in. And I give, I give all the credit to my sister because she was the one who inspired us to do it in the first place. And it's something that we don't plan on stopping. We want to continue that. Um, so that's how the story began. Continuing on from there, she passes away in 2009, and within five years, her oldest daughter, Jamie, is diagnosed with leukemia. And, you know, there's a lot of emotions associated with that, and it's just tough to accept that. It's hard to imagine, wow, here we go again. But faces that we never will know or see, names of people that we'll never know, were there again for her. And those faces came in the shape of a bag of blood hanging from a pole that it saved my niece's life. She's doing great today. Um, and you know, praise the Lord, we're, we're happy to, about that. But we also were reminded just a few years after my sister passed, the need for blood donations. And so we just were reinvigorated to continue our mission uh, every October. And so Jamie's been a part of the recruiting process and helped us bring in more. But you know, 
that's cancer that struck in two different ways twice in our family. And I know many of your viewers are, are going to be able to associate with that in some capacity, unfortunately. Um, but if I could take that to a third step, unfortunately, her daughter, my niece, uh, recovers. She does fine. Five years, roughly, later, she has her oldest son. He uh, has a heart defect at birth, which required multiple open heart procedures. And again, he needed blood transfusions. So it's something that we unfortunately are very, very um, familiar with. We understand the need. Uh, my family just has, has been through something that we see as now an opportunity. It was a challenge. It was sad. But we also say, you know what? Terry said long ago, something good will come of this. And through each one of these situations, we know that the only way that happens is if we do something. And we have worked very hard, not taking any credit. Many, many other folks have worked very hard. And we have people who have showed up every October for 15 years to donate blood. And of course, we're working constantly to try to bring in new folks. You know, we have a, a population that we've learned over 15 years that continues to get older. That's the donation generation. We are working hard with our recruitment to bring in younger folks, educate them on the need, help people understand that it could be you today, it could be me tomorrow. Before you and I get home this evening, it could be one of us. Uh, you talked about the numerous reasons in the introduction there with, with reasons that someone could need a blood transfusion. Cancer is a big one, and that's what I'm familiar with. But surgeries, uh, births, deliveries, car accidents, there's a number of reasons out there and we don't know it, I'm guilty of this, we don't know it until we need it. I didn't recognize the need until it hit my family. And then, you know, my eyes are open to it, and so we've worked very, very hard to try to help the people that will be next. The one thing I could say about, you're never gonna see the face of the person. You're never gonna know who it is that you helped. But I've been on the other side of it. I've sat there and held the hand of my niece while she received that blood. And you know what, we don't care who that person was. At that moment, you don't worry about skin color, <clears throat> politics, nothing matters. You're happy that somebody donated a unit of blood to save your family member's life. And so we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep our effort moving forward. Anthony, you are amazing in sharing the story and the strength of your family. And the Terry Massey Memorial Drive is inspiring so many to give. And what you've shared today will no doubt inspire others. She was right. Something good yeah. will come of this. And thank you for making sure that it happens and allowing the Red Cross to be a part of this. Oh, absolutely. Without you and what you do and your team, I give a lot of credit to your team. We have overwhelmed them at times over the years. And that was our goal. We said we want to bring in as many donors as we can. And I know they've worked very hard. I've witnessed your team for 15 years work very hard to get as many people through the door as we possibly can. Because we know that somewhere out there today, tomorrow, or within the next couple weeks, someone's going to face an, an incident, uh, a tragic situation, and they're going to need that unit of blood. We always say you never plan to need it. No one, it's never a planned event when you need a unit of blood. But the one thing that we can do is plan to donate. I couldn't have said it better. What a great way to wrap up this part of the segment. Thank you and um, please stay tuned after this short break for more of Building Strong Communities. Sometimes I dream about you Falling through the sky can hardly believe my own eyes. Disasters don't take a break for the holidays. With your help, neither does the Red Cross. Welcome back to Building Strong Communities. And now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome my friend, Becky Neal, who is a cancer survivor and has a passion for blood donation. Becky, thanks for coming. And can you tell us a little about your journey? Oh, absolutely, Erica. And thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to help advocate for not only that, but breast cancer awareness. 
both my mother and sister were pet breast cancer survivors, so I was very aware of self-examinations. I've had several lumps, uh, lumpectomies. I've had titanium inserted since in my early 20s. And then in April of 2022, I noticed that there was something strange. Um, I noticed a lump that was growing. And it started out with about that small, and then I checked it about a week later, and it had grown to almost that much. I contacted my primary care physician, and I could tell that you got to listen to your body, and I could tell there was something wrong. And whenever I went to the primary care physician, which I've been at seeing for years, I could tell in her eyes that once she did the examination that she knew, I knew it before we walked out the door. It was just a confirmation through her. She sent me over for a mammogram and an ultrasound due to the fact that I have what we call dense breast, where it's hard to determine uh, where a lump or something that could be uh, not right whenever they do the uh, mammogram. So they did an ultrasound. And then the next thing I know, I was referred to a general surgeon to do a core needle biopsy. So let's say it started in April, and in mid-May, um, I went and had a core needle biopsy. And of course, me being a stubborn, strong-willed, independent person, I got all my notes put together as to what to ask the general surgeon because neither my mother or sister had to go through chemo. They had just partial mastectomy and then a mastectomy. So I, my daughter and I went into the general surgeon's office and I had my notes of how long was it going to be for me to be off work, um, um, how long would the surgery take, how long was recovery, and then he said that, Becky, it's not like that. He said, you've been diagnosed with a rare breast cancer disease, which was called invasive ductal carcinoma with a triple negative and it was growing at a 92% rate. So as I noticed it, when I first noticed it, it was so small, then it kept growing and then kept growing. And so in the meantime, they had also scheduled me for PET scans to make sure that it had not gone into any other organs in my body. And at that time it had not. Um, they referred me to an oncologist and he saw it and Whenever I first went into there, they asked me if I would do clinical trials because it is rare. So I signed to be a clinical trial patient um, to, in order to help other research uh, data so they could be able to help other patients that are diagnosed with this. So fast forward, I started my first chemo treatment in July. Um, it was very aggressive treatment. And when I got back home, um, I thought that, okay, you know, we're going to get a little nausea and things like that. But the next day, I couldn't use my legs. I had neuropathy. Um, it was too strong of a dosage. I crawled to the restroom, crawled back, called my oncologist, and he said, we will stop the treatment for 21 days. So you can imagine the anxiety that I had in between the 21 days of being my first treatment and not knowing the percentage of the rate that it had. There was a lot of anxiety. They tweaked the cocktail a little bit and got it to where it wasn't as aggressive. I had 16 uh, treatments once a week. And actually, they draw blood every time before you have your treatment to make sure that your blood levels are the ad adequate enough to be able to go through the chemo treatments. So after the 16 treatments, then I thought, okay, we're gonna move on. And my daughter had, and son-in-law had been with me throughout the whole thing, family and friends. I became a sorority, a member of a sorority that I did not choose to be in, but I welcomed it with open arms. As you can see here in front of me, whenever I was first diagnosed, I started receiving um, hope from other cancer women all across the United States. And one of the things that I do encourage people if you are first diagnosed with cancer is that you get a chemo buddy, someone that has gone through it because I had so many questions. I did not know about the, the core uh, 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 port that they put in. And so my friend, coworker Jay, who I keep with me every day, and he is, has been an 
an inspiration to me. He answered all my questions. He has since passed away from his cancer treatment. And now I am becoming a chemo buddy for several people that I didn't realize that I was going to be able to do. Um, Erica, I am happy to say that I am sitting in front of you after 19 treatments because I had to go into immunotherapy. Um, with, and then after that, I had a double mastectomy because I said if I have a 50% chance of it coming back, I took, control of the, I took control of myself. And so I had the, my last surgery was November 10th, and I sit here today cancer-free. That is such an amazing story, Thank and you. I Thank you. am not surprised at the way you <laughs> approached this. So strong, so organized, right, right, so right. prepared, right. Um, and now taking the opportunity to help others right. and, you know, talk about not only what they can do, you know, if they're diagnosed with cancer, but also you said a lot of people have to utilize blood, That's right? Correct. And we know that, that with cancer correct. treatments and a quarter of the blood utilized that is um, correct. in the U.S. is through, you know, cancer patients and their treatments. That's correct. I, I wonder if you might be able to talk to us about your passion for that and Absolutely. what message you have. Absolutely. My passion is an advocate for breast cancer cancer awareness became even more during I was uh, uh, one of the hosts of a 5k color run and we partnered with the American Cancer Society and I did not realize that whenever you see your loved one laying in that hospital bed and you see the blood that's hanging up there that's giving them life you take for granted that it's just always there and then whenever she had explained to me about how many cancer patients that you had mentioned in the beginning of the show, I was struck. I was just like, this, this is unbelievable. Um, one out of three that you had mentioned and a quarter percentage, 25 percentage of the blood uses is for cancer patients. So that's whenever I found my other second passion was to be an advocate and let people know because I didn't know. We always take for granted that that blood supply will be there for our family members and our cancer patients. I have had friends, family, co-workers that have received this much needed blood transfusion um, due to the fact one was surgery, one um, is just bleeding internally through the um, cancer treatments that she has been going through and she's still battling. So not only is Becky going to be an advocate for breast cancer awareness? But I also want your listeners, and I hope this touches many, many people, to realize the need to donate blood. You know, you mentioned it, there are so many uses for blood and we do take for granted that it will be there. It's one of those few products that can't be manufactured. Exactly. And so exactly. it takes the, the generosity of spirit of, exactly. you know, our fellow, you know, um, friends, family and strangers right. to donate. Right. And so you sharing the story um, will certainly inspire others. Yeah. You know, you have um, so much experience now. Um, you've asked people to consider, you know, donating blood. Um, what can you also tell people who may be battling cancer and, you know, what, what kind of advice right. might you give? One of the biggest advices I, that I could be able to give is, as, as I first mentioned before, is to surround yourself with a team. I was very blessed with my faith, my family, and my friends. But also I needed that person to be able to guide me through the journey because it is a journey that no one else knows how to experience it unless you've gone through it yourself. You know, the many side effects that you have. But my, th my thing that I want to get the message out to cancer patients is bring hope over fear. Bring peace over chaos. And at the end of the day, those good days that you have, relish within those. Those bad days that you have, it's okay. But most of all, I also want to include that they seek counseling because there's no guidebook for cancer. And it it's, doesn't mean that you're weak. Um, you know, I told you in the beginning that I am a very stubborn, independent person. But reaching out for help from that individual that sometimes you don't feel like you need to let your family know what is going on. So that is the message that I want to bring to cancer patients right now, that it's okay no matter how you feel, but listen to your body. 
And that is such great advice. Um, you you mentioned the many treatments and therapies mm -hmm. um, that you you know underwent to mm -hmm. be sitting here healthy <laughs> with us today. Um, and you know, I wonder if you can just talk about what those treatments were again. And you know, I know immunotherapy, for instance, that you had right. mentioned sometimes right. utilizes blood. I don't think in your instance it needed to. No, it um, did not. But I'd love to just you know walk sure. through those a little sure. bit. Sure. The um, chemo treatments that I had received was also with what they call Taxol. And so that is a very um, weakening medication that you have to have. But after, like I said, after that I had the immunotherapy treatment with Keytruda because I am a clinical patient um, that because of the rare disease that they wanted to try everything in the books that is newly and research is going on daily and daily. So that is the immunotherapy, I had nine of those and then, then that's whenever I went in the surgery phase. Well, you know, I think um, when it comes to giving great advice, um, you are, you know, the go-to um, for sure. <laughs> and, you. you know, when it comes to inspiring mm -hmm. um, the audience here on mm -hmm. the show to mm -hmm. um, do whatever they can, mm -hmm. you've mentioned that a quarter of our blood supply is utilized for cancer patients' treatment um, and, you know, your own personal experience yes. for, you know, why it's so important that people People do what they can um, if they're healthy to get yes. out there and give blood. Thank so, you. Becky, thank you. You're a true inspiration, and I know that you'll make so many positive impacts thank through this you. work. Thank you, Erica. Absolutely. And with that, I'm so grateful that both Anthony and Becky could join us today to explain how important blood donation is, especially for those battling cancer. If you've had cancer and want to donate blood, You'll need to check and make sure your blood will be accepted. There are some kinds of cancer and cancer treatments that mean a survivor will not be allowed to donate, but for most other kinds of cancer, you may be able to donate blood if you've finished treatment for your cancer and it's been at least 12 months since your treatment ended. The best way to find out if you're allowed to donate is to call us at 1-800-RED-CROSS or visit redcrossblood.org. You can also dedicate your donation to someone affected by cancer after your donation. To schedule a blood donation today, call 1-800-RED-CROSS, visit redcrossblood.org, or download the Red Cross Blood Donor app today. It features find local blood drives and donation centers quickly and easily, and you can conveniently and easily make a scheduling appointment. You can also reschedule on the app. You can receive appointment reminders Complete our rapid pass prior to your appointment to minimize the time you need to complete health history and questionnaires at the actual blood drive. And you can keep track of your blood donations to see your impact. You can actually track your blood donation from donation through hospital delivery where it may be transfused to a patient in need. So thank you for joining us today and contact your local Red Cross or the number on the screen Visit our website or follow us on social media to learn more about the services Red Cross provides in your community and how you can be a part of it.